Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. I tell this story all the time now, but it's crazy. Like, we literally had somebody who couldn't get on the show for 10 minutes, and oh, Jason no. they got on the all we got on the show. And they were just like, we were just joking around the whole thing, but that's just how it goes. Like, we now think the fireside chats aren't the fireside chats without technical issues, but <laughs> um, it's really good to have you on the show. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Jess? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, uh, um, jump right into it. I'm going to give off an introduction for Jess, um, which I love the first few lines in this. I I ran this over with Jess, and I just realized there was a rhyme in here. So I'm going to kind of like emphasize. Here we go. Jess Turner is an ultra runner who is a two-time 100-mile finisher and recently became a 250-mile finisher with the 2023 edition of the Cocodona 250. Jess is also a CrossFit athlete and a dog mom, of which one of those is extremely important. Um, obviously, CrossFit athlete. <laughs> um, Jess also ran the Cocodona 250 for Forging Youth Resilience, FYR, a Flagstaff-based nonprofit organization with the goal of empowering at-risk youth to build physical and mental strength for life. So there's a, a lot going on here with your story, and there's just so many questions I want to ask you. But I think the first question, the first thing I want to know is, how did it all start for you? Where did your endurance sports journey begin? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a fun question <laughs> because as a kid, I played sports and running was always the punishment and I always dreaded running every bit of it. Um, and then I got to college and I got pretty out of shape just studying all the time. And at some point I was like, all right, I got to get it together here. <laughs> Um, so my now husband and I would walk down to the university track and we'd go and we'd like, I would try to run a hundred meters at a time and I just couldn't do it. And I'd have to stop after like 75 meters and then I'd walk another hundred meters and like just slog through like two miles maybe of that. And meanwhile, he was just like lapping me over and over. <laughs> He just has that like kick to be able to do it. And I just didn't because I was never a runner and never had any intention of being a runner. And over time, like we started doing that like two, maybe three times a week. And I would try to like do 110 meters without stopping. And then that turned into, oh my gosh, I ran a full lap without stopping. And, um, and so part of that was like, I didn't really have a goal and I wanted to like set something that I thought would be really hard and there's a summer running series here in town and I thought okay that's a good challenge like there it was a series of six races at the time um, and they all had like a short course and a long course so the short course would be like 5k and then the long course would be like a 10k or a 15k or a half marathon and so I signed up and I was like all right I maybe can run three miles maybe but I gotta like train for this <laughs> and so I I did and um at the last minute I I contacted the race director and I said can I switch it to the long races? And he was like, yeah, no problem. And so I was like, oh shoot, <laughs> this is happening. <laughs> um, and so I challenged myself to go down and run six miles at the track and just see if I could do it continuously. And it was, I like took a pen with me and I was just like making tally marks on my hand to make sure I was doing the full amount. And after 24 laps, I was like, holy cow, I just ran six miles. Like what? That's crazy. And um, and then I got to the restart and it's not on a track, it's trail and it's hilly. And I was not prepared for that at all. Um, and that was kind of my first moment of like, I'm about to do something hard. This is, I'm not totally prepared for this. And, you know, it took me well over an hour to finish that first 10K. And um, 
I barely get out of the car when we got home. And I just was like, who does this? Like who can run more than that? And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how it started. And then it just kind of progressed. Like, I was like, maybe I can run nine miles. Maybe I can do the 15 K and sure enough, like I did it. And then that just progressed to half marathons and marathons and, you know, just find, trying to find that boundary of what am I actually capable of and how far can I take my brain? Because that was always the determining factor was when you allow yourself to say, it's going to hurt, but I'm going to go there. It's, you can do so much more than you realize. And for me, that was like, wow, like there's a whole world of possibilities here. And and like, what is that limit? And I have yet to find it, uh, which is a little scary, but um, yeah, so that's how I got started in it all. And um, I by no means thought that I would come to enjoy running when I started. Like I hated every second of it. I would be like cursing as I'm slogging through my hundred meters, but you know, now it's like, I don't feel good unless I get out the door and just get the heart rate up. So yeah, that's a little bit about my background too, endurance sports. I mean, it's just, even just hearing you talk a lot, running a few hundred meters at a time and going from that to doing like six miles to doing like a trip. It's just, it reminds me of my own story of like running a quarter mile and then like going run 30 minutes at a time. Can I run a 5k? Can I run a half? And just it's amazing how we keep, once you decide you're going to try to find limits and just rely on it's amazing how we just moving the goalposts and now, you're, you know, you're 100, you've done 200, and you look, you're like, like the other day, like, or a few weeks ago, I did a training run or a tune-up and I was like, man, I did like six miles, but it wasn't great. And my, and my girlfriend was literally like, do you know, do you realize what you just said, considering you were doing like a quarter of a mile yep. just like <laughs> four or five years or whatever ago, yeah. but like yeah. moving the goalposts. Um, yeah. So I wanted to segue into, um, for those of you who don't know, you can look at it after the fireside chat. I'll put the links up, but there's a two part story website of Jess's Copidona 250 journey. So a lot of these questions are coming from that and just kind of getting more insight from Jess and how she was feeling in the moment. Uh, this is one of my favorite moments from the first part of the story. Uh, but you were watching the Coca-Dona live stream. I was also watching the Coca-Dona live stream. It was mind blowing. Um, although it didn't seem that way with the choppy drone footage, but mind blowing does. <laughs> and then you went to do a volunteer shift after Prestige finished in first place and you watched Peter Mortimer came in. So take people through that moment how you felt and what changed in you in that moment. Yeah, for sure. So I signed up for like the finish line aid station uh, just because I wanted to be a part of it somehow, some way, and just experience like that energy and just what kind of imagine what those runners had gone through throughout that 250 mile journey. And I, you know, we sat there for quite a while before um, Peter came in and um, you could feel this buzz in the air. Like there was like, just like this cool energy, like everybody was getting amped up because he was about to come in. And it was like, everyone started to gather and like, mind you, ultras are not a big spectator sport. It's very spread out and like, you get a few cheers here and there, but there was like this huge buzz around the, the finish line because it takes place in uh, downtown Flagstaff. So there's a lot of foot traffic and then like people start like hearing that something's about to happen. And um, we, we were watching his tracker and watching him come and get closer. And then like all of a sudden this like cheering and just like all this energy just poured out. And he just came across the finish line and I'll never forget it. It was like the most, energetic second place women I've ever ever experienced he just was like on fire and after 250 miles you couldn't tell that he had been out there for days and like no sleep and just like he looked so strong and 
everybody just gathered. Somebody got him a chair and like, we all just kind of sat around, like, tell us the stories, like what happened out there? And it was just like such a cool experience. And uh, yeah, in that moment, I was just like, I, this is, I want some piece of this, like, this is cool. And like, just thinking about like all of the issues that he had, like he had some dehydration issues and like food issues and like overcoming that over the days that he was out on the course and you know making a big comeback it was I I wanted somehow some way to be a part of that and um at the time like my foot was actually broken and I didn't I didn't really know I didn't know it at that point um but I knew it in the next couple months there and um I was like, one day I'm going to, I'm going to be here and I'm going to do this. And I want to experience some sort of this journey and mine will be different, but it's going to be a really, really life changing experience. So yeah, that's, that's how I like was like determined. I'm like, I'm, I'm doing this someday. I'm, I don't know when, but I'm going to do it. So yeah, it was, it was so cool watching Pete come over the finish line and yeah, that energy was not n nothing like I've ever experienced. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Thank you so much for like trying to do as best as you can because like I just crossed that finish line a couple of weeks ago and I've been around on the runner and like well you're I understand it but it's so hard to explain the buzz of a two hundred miler and just like being out there and just like I even had that conversation with a friend who's done a two hundred of like. Just imagine we've all been out there for four or five days. Just imagine all the stories between all the runners and all the experiences they had both together and individually. Like you could write an entire book for each person. You can write a book for everyone together. It's just, it's just so amazing. Um, but uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that your foot was broken and you didn't quite know about it. That was the next thing I wanted to segue into. So uh, one of the things we talked about in the story website was your foot injury and that surgery was prolonged until May 2022 which is wild because I had Sion in 2022 and did not realize you did that race based on a broken foot. Um, <laughs> so you, you mentioned finding yourself um, watching the 2022 live stream of Cocodona while you were waiting for your surgery. Uh, so what what change in you in that moment and made you realize that you would overcome anything regarding this injury in life to get to the start line of Cocodona? Yeah, so luckily I found a surgeon that was really understanding of how passionate I am about running and how much it means to me and how much it meant to just like start the journey of healing and getting going. And I feel really fortunate for that because I've, I've heard some horror stories and um, he just knew like, I, I gotta be out on the trails to be happy. And so I, I found him and he, like he said, he did the surgery the week of Cocodona and I was literally sitting in the hospital bed waiting for my surgery, watching the live stream thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there next year. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get to the start line healthy and ready for that, but I'm gonna do it. And um, it was a long road. I actually had a fracture that uh, was non-healing for over a year. And um, so he went in and had to remove that piece of bone that wasn't uh, healing at all. And he had to go through like a tendon. And so he had to like split the tendon and that causes it to be like a really long recovery and just like achy and sore for a really long time. Um, <clears throat> but I actually found that with the right people around you, you can work towards that. Even if the gains are small every day, putting that in the bank every single day just really pays off. So like I went to physical therapy after surgery, I started doing all the home exercises, um, like not going out too, too hard, too fast and really letting like that tendon and everything heal. Um, but doing a lot of like strength work on the side with CrossFit and just making sure that like my joints were going to be able to take the impact from running when it was time and just working towards that every single day. And eventually I was able to start putting some real runs together and start putting some real mileage together. 
um, because it turns out if you're going to run 250 miles, you have to do a lot of running beforehand. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was a, it was a long road, but it was just like, I, once I made that determination that I was going to do it, that was it. I, I knew like every day I had to show up every day counted. I didn't have that extra time to, to really like take my time towards getting towards the start line because it was a pretty tough recovery with my foot and getting it to a place where it would be manageable to to get to the start line and I actually when I got to the start line my foot felt better than it has ever and so like I just really attribute that to like all the professionals that helped me along the way to me like my body work my PT the surgeon like everybody just helped me get there and they like saw the vision with me and knew that I could just commit to being able to get it done and and uh, get there healthy so I feel really fortunate actually that was a big part of why I was there it was just the the people around me really believed that I could do it. Yeah, it's amazing what the uh, the right circle around you do as far as like helping you achieve your goals. Um, and it's just it's like what a long road. I'm not only going from the surgery, but like having that road to recovery, getting to that moment where you can like do that first run and really like see that as a chapter of like hey training like started started like um and going from that getting to the start line i can i can imagine and, and this is something that i would love to go into depth to um when we talk a little bit more about coca 250 but just your feelings when you towed the start line because it's just such a long road but before we get into that uh, i wanted to ask you uh, because it's such a big part of what you did and you raise a significant amount of money and awareness for them, uh, forging youth resilience. Uh, talk about forging youth resilience, why you chose that organization and what that cause means to you and how it helped you get through tough times during Cocodona 250. Yeah, definitely. Um, so forging youth resilience provides free CrossFit style workouts for at risk and underserved youth. Um, and we also provide nutrition education and mentorships and um, for me, that organization is so special because CrossFit really played a big role into who I am today because I was a very non-confident person. I was very shy, didn't believe in myself. And when I went to CrossFit, I just remember walking in and everybody being like, this is hard, but if anyone can do it, you can do it. And over the years of doing CrossFit, it was just really an encouraging community. And, you know, like oftentimes people would be like, I know you can do this. And for me, that would just like help build my confidence. And that's the same feeling that we give those kids. And that's why I chose this organization. So when I look at the kids that we serve, it's, you know, kids who are in and out of juvenile detention or their mom and dad are in and out of jail for drug use or domestic violence or all sorts of issues, um, or even just coming from a low socioeconomic status background. Like these kids have the cards stacked against them. And when they come into the gym and they hit a lift that they weren't expecting they could hit and like that encouragement and that feeling that that community provides is exactly what I think these kids need to be able to feel confident in themselves, believe in themselves, shoot for the moon, go for it, like professionally, athletically, personally, I think it's just such a huge part of building a better person and, and making these kids like see that there's more to them than what their circumstances have dealt them. Um, and so with that, we raised over $6,000 with my charity bib running for fire and, um, yeah, I was, I was blown away with the amount of support I received and, um, yeah, those kids, man, that, that like pushed me in, in some places I was just like not feeling good. And I just thought about those kids, like they have it so much worse than me right now. And I'm three days in no sleep middle of the two fifty, like, you know, they're, they're homeless. They're running away from home. They're, you know, dealing with mom and dad, you know, doing drugs in the bathroom and, like, I, I can do this. This is going to be the easy part. The hard part is, like, getting to those kids, serving more of those kids, and, like, being there for them. Um, 
it's a very near and dear organization to my heart. I, I think the organization does a phenomenal job with the funds that they get. Um, and there's local clubs. So like there's the Flagstaff club, but then like there's clubs all over the nation that like are just pockets of little CrossFit gyms that decided they wanted to help the community as well. And so for me, that's really cool too, because that means like it's further reaching than just my little town. And I think that that brings up the awareness that, you know, we can serve kids all over the country. And so, yeah, I love fire. I love what they do. And I love that we can build the confidence of these kids. I, I love hearing that because, I mean, there are, you can have, I've always believed that you can have both intrinsic and extrinsic, extrinsic doing these races. Um, you can have it, 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 your personal personal goals of like pushing your but you can also you know for me when I hear like say that running is an inherently selfish sport I'm like you have not seen ultra running and you've not seen just the amazing things people in this community and ex you hearing you talk about for resilience kind of just makes me think about like the work you do for Ridstone and um, I just love seeing people other people do work like for the youth and um, I love that line about just like having these kind of organizations and having resources in like, like other places around the nation because I truly believe that well. And even with FYR, like if there were organizations like that, then the then the youth would be such a better place. Um, and it's just it is true that like there are moments where like I feel like because a two hundred can like really just break you and build up that having that extrinsic factor of like kids are going through is much harder and it's not a choice but what i'm doing is a choice uh can really just like propel it's just and that's just i'm encouraging everybody to shot run for a charity that's near and dear to your heart do something uh go out there and do something uh for any charity that's near and dear to your heart and just see how far you soar and how how much how many lives you change, you know it or not um yep. but now it really makes me want to go into the coca 250 so let's dive right into that <laughs> out here um but let's start with the start line because we talked about your injury and the road you take to get the, the people that surrounded you and supported you in it what was it like for you and those around you, um, uh, when you got to that start, you were towing that start line and realized you made it. Yeah, that was such a huge moment to show up healthy to the start line. And, you know, my husband even took a video at the beginning and was like, how, how are you feeling? And I was like, actually, I don't feel nervous. I feel ready. I did the work. I know that my body is ready. I'm capable. I've done every training run i've done all the mobility exercises and everything that i had to work through um and so for me it was just like i can't believe i made it to the start line with so much awareness around fire so much um support from the communities like i you know katula who you work with is was a big uh, partner in, in my fundraising. And um, just like having the support of these communities is really cool. And it was more like, I can't let these people down now. Like now I just gotta go do this cause I'm ready and I'm healthy. And I'm, I'm like so happy that I can bring my, my run to the cause that I believe in. And um, so for me, it was like almost a victory lap. Like, I get to go like put this out there now and everybody can kind of like see what I worked for and and experience that like that that buzz that I was talking about with Peter. So, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was extremely happy to be in a really good place mentally and physically at the start line. So, the way I'm going to break down Okudona moving forward um, is because there's so many ways to break down 200. And there's no way we can encompass this in 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but like, talk about uh, just like, what were some of your favorite moments in the race? Uh, what were some of your like toughest moments during the race? I know for a lot of people, that's like Mingus Mountain. Um, 
<laughs> and just um i was like and i guess the follow-up to that is like me personally as a 200 mile finisher myself i'm always you know like how was your sleep <laughs> <laughs> that's always the question <laughs> um yeah <laughs> so um yeah, so some really awesome points were, um, so my best friend actually flew out from Florida to come pace me for the first portion. So she caught me at uh, Whiskey Row and then took me to the top of Mingus, um, which was just really cool because she had to like organize it around her daughter's birthday. And so she like flew out here the day before and then caught a red eye on the way back just to be here for me and make it happen. Um, so that was just such a special time to be able to spend that time with her. Um, the, the coolest sunrise I've ever seen in my life was at the top of Mangus and I'll never forget it. It was just the most beautiful hues with like a mist in the mountains and like at the moment I was hurting so bad and I was so sleep deprived, but that I was like, this, this is exactly why I do this. Like nobody else is out here experiencing this. And, you know, I was just like, so thankful for that. And I knew that was going to carry me into the next day where I knew I was going to be suffering. Um, so, yeah, so I think in total, I probably got about seven or eight hours of sleep. Um, I think I probably laid down for about 10, but you know, you know how it is. It's like everything aches and you're like rolling around and not really sleeping and, um, probably my lowest point was going into Fort Tut Hill. Um, so that was like, uh, mile 214 ish. And I just, the sleep deprivation had taken its toll and I had powered through the last section just to try to bank some time so that I could get some sleep. And so I got there and my husband was like, you can sleep for two hours. And I was like, oh, that's so much. I can't wait to get two hours of sleep. Um, but I think at, at that moment, I like I actually did sleep at Fort Tuthill, but I when I woke up, everything just started to swell and nothing like was functioning like it should. I couldn't keep food down without indigestion being a real issue. Um, and that's where the problems really started. <laughs> was like, like my feet had gone numb at that point. Like I had nerve damage before that, which was really terrible. But um, the sleep deprivation and just like the overall swelling and my body just like rejecting what I was doing really took toll on, on that, on that last day. And, um, yeah, the, the food situation was tough because everything I would eat, I just would feel nauseous and I just had to like eat Tums like they were candy <laughs> and try to get through it. Um, but you know, yeah, there were a lot of really cool moments just like, that course is one that you know it, you can't do it justice in in any sort of words like experiencing it in and i i always say this like 200 milers i think break you down to your core and what you are at the core level is like you start to appreciate everything and it starts to be like this wow that's a really cool rock or like I've never looked at the trees this way because I've never stopped and looked at them, you know, and just like those like experiences of seeing those landscapes in that lens were, it was incredible. I'll, you know, if you know, cause you've done a 200 miler, but it's like this very um, raw experience where you get to experience like this uh, new lens. It almost feels like you're a new person in those, you know? And so for me, that was just, a really cool experience to be able to um, get to that and see who I am at that level. And it turns out it's not so bad. <laughs> so. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I'm not too bad myself, you know, it's just yeah. <laughs> like one of the, uh, one of the things I did to test like my, um, to test like how lucid I was, was tell two dad jokes at every <laughs> <laughs> Nice. One of the volunteers tears is like oh it's, it's funny now but it's gonna be even more funny when you're telling those jokes to a tree and i was like i hope not but <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> follow-up question to your sleep quick follow-up question to your, how much of that was like sleeping through vehicle or at the cots uh, versus like sleeping on the trail and taking trail naps yeah so i really
I really tried to limit my time on the trail maps portion because those just were so unproductive. Like I tried one and I was like, I think I can like get some like catch up sleep and then I'll feel better and I'll be rejuvenized and I can just like go out and keep going. And they just were really unproductive at a certain point. So most of my sleep was like in the back of our truck or on the cots um, at the aid stations. Um, which were tricky because you're in there with other people. And so, you know, I learned that you should take some earplugs <laughs> um, and actually use them. I think I had some, but I just didn't use them. Um, so that that's a learning point. But yeah, I think I just got more useful sleep when I actually like put myself in a bed situation and, and just like sat down, got in, ate, let the food digest, and then like moved right into the bed and just like made it happen. <laughs> so it was I, like, I had to be intentional about sleeping for sure. I, I will say that like um, sleeping on the cots that helped me out a lot. I might've had some good trail naps, but like I remember going and taking like a two hour sleep, my first one of the entire race. So, gosh, like it was it was like mile 140 or something and i just remember waking up and everybody was like you look like a totally different person <laughs> yeah yes. yeah exactly <laughs> it's amazing what two hours can do <laughs> it's amazing and it's just what going back to what you said about like how these races almost create like build you a minimal mindset that almost like carries over to life but like the way you experience things in a 200 like um, I don't know that I would appreciate yakisoba noodles as much as I would with a joke at an aid station sitting down and chatting with volunteers and exchanging stories and just, I mean, I don't know that I would appreciate something like that outside of that lens or like seeing the trees or when the sunrise comes and the sun hits you and all of a sudden your body feels rejuvenated yeah. and it's like such a wild feeling that so hard to like explain like why am I running right now where yeah. did this come from and then 20 minutes later like why am I stumbling <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah I think to your point I I when I finished I just felt this overwhelming sense of gratefulness grateful for the course for being so hard grateful for my crew and my pacers and all the volunteers and the race director just everything just made me really thankful for everyone who was involved and made it happen and um yeah so i think that like also lends it to like being grateful to be able to serve for those kids and you know pushing forward for them as well there was a um i don't know if i'm remembering this correctly but i was following your stories um during cocodona and there was like one moment where you were just taking a break on a log um, yeah <laughs> about that moment because that one made me laugh really hard you just had you just look so tired and done but you were also like let's go you know like yeah. okay <laughs> yeah at some point you're like well this isn't helping me finish so i might as well just be suffering and keep moving so yeah totally <laughs> yeah it's um it's funny it's it's like wild when you get to the point where like sitting down is not really helping you that much anymore yeah. i i to your point about like sleep, I think one of the hardest things about not just getting quality sleep, like with the earplugs, is like waking up from the sleep and your body's like all yeah. stiff and you have to get out of this warm bed, yes. <laughs> step out, and, and then your body needs like 20, 25 minutes to like tune up again and start yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so true. And it's like, I remember leaving Fort Tuthill and I was like, everything's broken right now. Like, nothing is firing. No cylinders are firing right now. So, yeah. yeah it's, just, it's just so wild. Um, I know one question that I always have for other runners doing this, and I'll exchange you one of mine um, so before I have you answer this question. When I was on the trip uh, on the single track, uh, I saw Shrek looking at me. And he was just like smiling at me proudly. And I just like smiled back at him. And I remember telling my girlfriend, like, I see Shrek. And she was paying, like, you need a nap. And I was like, yeah, yes. um, indication number one that you need some sleep. I saw like Shrek. I saw a clown, a horse, um, a panda bear crossing the, the road was the wildest one nice. for me because I'm like, oh, so visceral and real. And, my hallucinations are usually very pedestrian. 
but tell me a little bit about like uh, hallucinations you had or moments you had. Yeah, so my first hallucination started um, coming out of Prescott towards Mingus. And um, I was with my best friend at that time. She was pacing me. And it's really, it looks like the African plains almost out there. And she was like, all right, tell me if you see a zebra. And I was looking out. I was like, I don't see a zebra, but I see a goat <laughs> that I know isn't there. And uh, so that's about when it started. Um, and then I did have a moment where I thought I saw a van in the middle of the forest that definitely didn't exist. Um, and then lots of tarantulas. Um, at one point, I thought I saw a mountain lion, but it was just a rock. And, you know, I like had to do like a triple take because it was still there after the second look. And was, you know, yeah, it's really interesting what your mind does. Um, I, I really like kind of try to control things. And so that was one of those things I was like, you know, this is made up, just control it. It's okay. Don't panic. It's not a real mountain lion. <laughs> just keep moving. I don't know if this happens to you as well, but one of the ones I know for sure was fake is I think sometimes when your body wants to see things or your mind wants to see things. And as I, I know, as I'm closing into an aid station or a few miles away or two and a half away, I turn around and all of a sudden, every rock looks like a car. Everything looks like a tent. Yes. And I see people on. I'm like, is that the aid station? Is that the yeah. aid station? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're just trying to envision a point where you can get some sleep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, one last question I had before, um, I guess our final question is, did you have any like food that actually worked for you? Because our Vipa is definitely known for like how good their food options are. Um, but is there any food that worked for you? And did you expect that this was going to be like your go-to food? Yeah, so I, like I said before, the indigestion hit really bad on the last day. Um, and so I was just trying to gut through it, but I knew I needed salt intake. And that ramen has never tasted better. I mean, <laughs> there's something about top ramen after four days of no sleep. Um, but yeah, I did, I did get a walking taco that was the best thing I've ever had in my entire life. And I kid you not, like I probably could have had like five of them, but I was like, I, I need to not lose my last meal that I have before I head up Eldon. Um, so that one, that was awesome. And then at Whiskey Row, they had pizza, which was just so good. Um, shout out to Arabipa for providing that pizza. Um, and then, yeah, quesadillas, I think I probably a dozen of those and um, lots of pickle juice. That was, that was my fan favorite. I rolled up to the top of Eldon and my last, uh, my last aid station, I had a cup of hot cocoa in one hand and a cup of pickle juice in the other. <laughs> and I was like, this, this is what it's about, right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it, it kind of went sideways. I, I didn't really think I was going to have so much um, like stomach problems. I thought I'd be able to get more liquid calories in. That went out the window like day two. Um, and then I just like had to force stuff down because I knew I needed the calories, but nothing sounded good. Um, and I always tried to eat right before I slept so that I had time to digest and that I wasn't like digesting as I was moving. Um, and that worked pretty well for the most part. Uh, I think there's some learning points there too, like to, to make sure that that happens, even though I didn't want to do it a couple of times, like I paid for it. Cause then I think that's also added to the indigestion was like sleeping and then eating and then starting to run again, like run. Um, and yeah, so I think I need to be more intentional about eating before I sleep and let that digestion happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's like always and for anybody who's watching like 200 miles like there's just no one clear answer for everybody. It's just like you look at people and you're like oh, and this person's got figure it figured out. You might try to say it does not work. It's yeah. just it's just not like a 100. Like there's just so many like and things to sleep and nutrition and I mean it's part of why I love it so much because it's such an unknown frontier yeah. um, but before we jump into the rapid fire section uh, 
because you've been on this like trajectory as somebody who was never a runner to being a 250 mile finisher, what advice would you have for somebody who's trying to get started and on the fence? Yeah, you know, I think if you are willing to be challenged, I think anyone can do this. I really do. From someone who couldn't run 100 meters when I started to being able to run 250 miles, I think anyone can do this. Um, it's a matter of your determination and your grit and finding something that inspires you and and sticking with that. And um, for me, a lot, for a long time, it was a confidence builder um, to start. And now it's become just something that I love doing every day, running with my dog and um, just getting out the door and being in nature and like being in the forest. Like, you know, it's just, such a good soul experience, but I think if you want it, anyone can do it. Uh, I think you just got to take that first step. Those first runs are going to be slogs and they're going to be hard. Um, but I promise you the runner's high does come <laughs> and um, start like making a community um, because that's the, I think that's the other part we, we didn't get to touch on, but the community is incredible. And if you can get in touch with some of the people in the running circles, like just, they're awesome people and they're nothing but encouraging. So just like go out and do it and, and start getting connected. Yeah, that's, that's sound advice, and I absolutely fully agree with everything you just said. Um, well, Jess, thank you so much for being on our show. Uh, and before we let you go, we're going to take you through our rapid fire. Questions. These are all fun questions related to food and uh, just a bunch of, like, miscellaneous shenanigan-y stuff. But, like, ready for a rapid fire? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, so first question uh this is a big one in our articles uh pineapple on pizza yay or nay nay <laughs> no, i know i've heard the discussions here <laughs> i'm team pineapple on pizza but it's just i find it so funny that the last like six seven people in a row have been like team pineapple and the one person who's not jason's not here to see it <laughs> yeah. he's gonna he's gonna be so happy that you're uh <laughs> workers so i mean but yeah that's uh <laughs> oh man boo -boo, but <laughs> uh oreos original or a double stuff double stuff uh, oh yeah yeah <laughs> um candy corn is it a real candy or is it earwax coated in sugar? real can candy <laughs> Ooh, that's the first one we've had of that in a while yeah, that's because that's it, it comes from my grandma. She was always getting me candy corn, and that was like our treat that we got from her. <laughs> right. um, peeps, uh, are they Amazon foam package, sour packages, or actual food? Amazon packaging, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, I totally agree with that. We had somebody send us a uh, shout out to Adina. As stale peeps because she loves stale peeps to actually <laughs> and just both gave it a shot and we're like we love you Adina but no <laughs> no. no thank you <laughs> so you have a so you have a burrito you have a tortilla uh, and you're making a burrito what do you put inside your ideal burrito Ooh, I'm going breakfast burrito all day scrambled eggs, some bacon, some shredded cheese, some hash browns, and some good salsa. Uh, good salsa and just good potatoes and like good eggs. Um, I love a good breakfast. You know, yeah. So. yeah, for sure. Um, are, are you a cake person or a pie person? Cake. What, what's your cake? I like a vanilla with a vanilla frosting. Like just keep it simple, plain and plain, but yeah. Love that love that um so a follow-up question about cake is red velvet a real flavor or is it just chocolate with red food dye Ooh, i think as much as i love it i think it's just red food dye <laughs> same <laughs> uh, so you go out for a run are you listening to music podcast or nothing at all nothing um, nothing at all me and my brain <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Uh, uh, favorite favorite Cthulhu gear? 
Ooh, I love their uh, nano spikes. That saved me this winter. I would not have been able to train for Kokodana without them. <laughs> so nano spikes for the win. I have to agree with you. Um, I spent a couple months in Flagstaff training for uh, a race that I did in Nepal, and I got there in March. There's going to be wind, uh, like it's going to be spring, and I knew it was going to be cold, but I didn't think it was going to be that cold. Still. Um, it was rough. <laughs> I remember running in Buffalo Park, and I remember running with Austin. He's like, we've never had a winter this prolonged. Yeah. Just yeah, it was tough. It made it really tough to train for Kogodono with that, but yeah, uh, I wouldn't have gotten all those training runs in without Katula's nano spikes, that's for sure. Yeah, I can, I can even imagine, like, I lived, like, 10 minutes from Eldon, and I did a lot of runs up there, and I remember the first time I tried to go up there without spikes, I could only get, like, halfway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it gets so packed, it, like, there's so many people on that trail, that it just turns to ice, and yeah, for sure. <laughs> I was trying to make my way up there from the fat man loop and I just had to do it. <laughs> yeah, no way. <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I have to agree with the net. I mean, those are, those are incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh, favorite movie or TV show? Oh Re boy. Um, I mean, I'm a big sports fan and football just started. So I think I'm just going to have to default to, to football at the moment. I'm on a fantasy league with all of my male coworkers and I have to kick butt as the only <laughs> female. So <laughs> what's your, what's your football team? The Packers. Packers. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm a Rams fan. Uh, okay. Okay. I can deal with that. <laughs> um, um, well, Yes, this has been great. Thank you so much for being on our show. Like a lot of fun talking to you and just hearing about your story and we'll have to get you back sometime. Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to join again. Uh one question I did have before we get off the show is what's next? Yeah, so I actually have a hundred mile relay with my husband this weekend and um he's gonna take the first half, I'm gonna take the second half and um, after that, I, I was luckily drawn for Canyon de Shea in October. I've been trying to get into that race for years. Um, that one's like a 55K. And then if I don't get drawn for Western States, then I'll probably do Kokodona again. Mm -hmm. so. I'm super excited about, about that and would love to like hear about that. And well, um, where can people follow you if they want to follow along on your journey? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram at JessTurner132. Um, I've got a Facebook page. Um, and then check out FIRE, um, ForgingYouthResilience.org um, to check out the national organization. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your show, Jess. Um, it was a good time, and I appreciate you taking it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Have a good rest of your evening. You too. Bye.